Tom here from Orange Systems, and we're going to do a follow-up video here on the DNS filtering. And I just wanted to make sure that I cover a few details that were asked in that previous video, including things I got wrong, which I did get a couple things wrong, specifically related to Cisco and OpenDNS. Second, I wanted to cover uh, just some overall my thoughts on a follow-up and some of the discussion that came from that whole deep dive, or I don't know how deep of a dive it was, depending on your opinion, but me testing all the efficacy of these DNS filtering systems and have a few more thoughts on there and keep the discussion going, of course. But first, if you'd like to learn more about me or my company, head over to lawrencesystems.com. If you'd like to hire a short project, there's a hire us button right at the top. If you want to support this channel in other ways, there's affiliate links down below to get you deals and discounts on products and services we talk about on this channel, including a link to our Patreon if you'd like to become a Patreon supporter. We also have a swag store where you can get shirts and other items that are for sale, and that changes from time to time what's available and what's not, so go ahead and check that out frequently. And finally, our forums. If you'd like to have a more in-depth discussion about this video, suggestions for new videos, or just reach out, say hi, and talk tech, our forums are a great place for that. All right, now back to the content. What I got wrong. And this was just an oversight on my part and me not taking the time I should have taken to dive deeper into this. This is a Cisco MSP console for Cisco Umbrella. What I showed was OpenDNS. Now, it turns out I was unable to sign up for an account because I had an OpenDS account. It kept bringing me back to there. And Cisco, because I was an OpenDNS user long before Cisco had purchased them, um, Cisco reached out, had a phone call, great conversation, and uh, they got me set up here on the proper dashboard. So I went ahead and ran the test again against the Cisco system here. And very similarly, they have a dashboard, much like the folks at DNS Filter did. And we checked the malware box, newly seen domains, et cetera, just like we see here. And then we go over here to networks and I set up specifically on my forums. No, that's not my IP address. That is the same IP address you've seen in a previous one. Thank you for all of you that messaged me and were looking out for me, but that's not my office IP. I should say it is an IP address. Um, and I used my forum server because it's just a little bash script. So I SSH into the forum server. I registered the forum server with the Cisco uh, system here and here are the results for that so we go over here and once again for the same reasons before i have all the domain names obscured so youtube doesn't flag me and we have the cisco umbrella scoring a 59 percent versus nine percent on the open dns now i also threw next dns in there and i got a million messages for everyone wanting me to test their favorite dns provider i i just don't have i mean i i don't have unlimited time but i've offered all the code up so you can test your DNS provider against this list. But we're going to get to the validity of that list. So there is definitely a difference, and it was my mistake that I did not use truly Cisco Umbrella. I was using OpenDNS, and I did verify from people that talked to at Cisco uh, that, yes, there is a difference in the way the feeds are for OpenDNS versus Cisco Umbrella, which is interesting because you use the same IP address. It's not that I even change what IP address to use. You just change, and it's also why I chose a different IP address rather than my office IP I chose before. I set it to the forum IP address and ran it from there. I didn't want any mistakes to be made or just end up with the same results because of anything in their system that would have pulled that old address. Now, next thing we can talk about, my forum post. I was really happy that this forum post had, you know, got a lot of attention. And I like because one of the things I had said at the end of the other video, this is kind of something I want to push through some scientific type review. I wanted other people to kind of vet what I did, look at my methodology, and improve upon it. Security is a team sport and we should all be team players in this provided you're on the side of defense. Now, there may be other people watching this, so I can't say all of you are uh, team players in security. There may be some other person that's unhappy the fact that uh, more people are teaming up for security, but it's kind of, uh, uh, in my opinion, it's that we're all in this together. And I was so happy to see not just responses from you know people in my forums, but from literally Quad9. I believe we have two different people who signed up here from uh, DNS Filter and just a lot of great discussion on this. And that's something that made me really happy was uh, seeing this. So uh, Quad9 also, by the way, great service in terms of uh, they went all the way into talking about uh, a lot of details. And we have Peter here. Um, he's from DNS Filter. So just an overall wonderful response. And this has been uh, just... I really couldn't be happier with all the response and things like that. And it's, it shows a commitment from those companies uh, that they care about their product, that they want people to use it, want people to have a good experience. And of course, they care a lot about security of it. Now, valid points. And really, I, I don't know how else to say this other than they're right in some ways that that list of domains I have, uh, 
yeah, some of them are old. And it's hard finding good lists of malware domains. It is literally the job of these security researchers to constantly be looking for the needles in a the haystack. They run extensive amounts of testing. They don't want false positives because, well, no one wants angry customers calling them and saying, well, I can't get to the website and I can't get my job done. Why do I pay you for? There's enough end user support from an IT management standpoint that we don't need to create more by blocking something valid. So they really try to keep the false positives down. They also, on the other side, are constantly looking for and trying to find out whenever there's some new ransomware, ransomware, malware, whatever that thing is that's going to be out there, whatever that latest threat is and angle that someone has on uh, ways of extorting a business out of money via some type of malware. And are they using some type of easy to find command and control server? Are they embedding it in something else, etc.? So there's a real challenge in finding these. And I still, one thing I was hoping but didn't come from any of this was someone posting, hey, Tom, here's a better feed. That was actually a little bit back on my head, hoping to find something better than that, but it didn't happen. So I do see their point that some of these had to be removed for false positive versus quad nine, not having a business use case just being a, uh, as they set up there, a complete nonprofit organization that also has no logging information uh, that just wants to sinkhole bad domains and pretty simple service. So my overall on this, which one should you use? Because that discussion, you know, was burning on and still going on in my forums, comes down to a couple things. One, for home users, Quad9, very aggressive, but works great. Also, the fact that they don't have any logging or dashboards if you're into privacy, which, hey, privacy matters quite a bit, makes a lot of sense. And uh, Quad9 is a great choice. Next, which one should you use for your business? Well, that's tricky. Quad9, testing it myself, I didn't find the internet broke when I used it here at our office or when I set it up at home. Uh, my internet experience was much the same, good. So using Quad9 from a business or a home user standpoint, both worked well, but why would you need logging? What about these other companies? Well, as I said, scope of this was specifically filtering out malware, not such things as gambling sites or people who are spend their day at work job hunting, and then you need some type of filtering to apply to a specific group or department in your business to try to keep them from going to sites you don't want them to. Second, logging. Quad9, although I really like them, the logging, the reason you need it very frequently is what if? What if you had a system that's just banging away at one of those bad domains? You see it making calls and it's getting sinkhole. That's great. But why is it making all those calls? That's referred to as an indicator of compromise. And once you have an indicator of compromise in your network, that should trigger an investigation. So Quad9, by not providing any type of threat intelligence logging back to you, kind of does not have that piece of information of why your system is making all these calls. By the way, if that particular malware has a list of sites and maybe one of those was not blocked and it slowly goes through and methodically goes through things or by some weird happenstance, the URL it's going through goes from being sinkhole to whitelisted later, well, now you have a problem where it finally got out and did the thing and you didn't have any notifications that it was doing that. So once you start getting into this, yes, this is going to be complicated. Now, the two last things I'm going to address is like Pi-hole and PF Blocker. One thing about PF Blocker and Pi-hole, they both use very common lists. And those lists, once again, comes back to our threat intelligence problem of finding good quality lists. And the SANS one I literally pulled from PF Blocker. I don't, haven't used Pi-hole in a long time, but I know, I believe, I should say, that it's still pulling from some of the same lists. And most of the lists, because the way the lists are formatted, should be cross compatible to put one list or the other in. Now, you're going to get a slightly different experience with those because now you're doing it at the level locally as before it leaves and goes out to an external DNS resolver. So, yeah, there's a really good chance of using those that you'll have that logging that you're looking for if you're using PFSense, if you're using it in those particular scenarios. So those are a couple of things to think about. And, of course, those were uh, questions asked is can you run this against Pi-hole? And the challenge is, I mean, it... it it comes down to what list you're using and feed you're using. And then if you pad that, because defense in depth, you want the pie hole list compared to the PF blocker list, or you take the PF blocker list and then you think about the resolver that's going out behind it. And you know you can kind of see where this gets complicated and you should have more than just this. This is all kind of basic sinkhole filtering, not in depth filtering. So these are my follow up thoughts. One, I want to cover and clear up that I got the Cisco one wrong, that there was a better score when it was run against the actual Cisco umbrella, not open DNS. Two, 
I was, I'm disappointed, and not in anyone, just in the fact that it's so hard. Uh, disappointed maybe is not the right word, just, um, I don't know, realizing the challenge, and maybe hopefully some of you realize the challenge that any threat researcher at any of these companies face trying to get good threat intelligence. It's a grueling, I mean, there's a, people have a passion for doing it, but you know, digging into this is not easy. There's not this magic list. Uh, building these threat intelligence things is hard. And of course, as we see in the internet, frequently something gets through, something gets missed, and these guys are working their butts off not to miss something, but it still happens. But I did achieve the goal of getting a conversation started about this, having a more open discussion, getting amazing feedback from the people at these companies so we can all learn more about their product. And uh, overall, I think this was a success in terms of uh, science testing and things like that. And I guess my, at least my uh, methodology didn't get too many holes poked in it. The last little thing is I will comment on is there was a Reddit post as well here. And it was just reiterating because uh, someone asked me if I'd seen the Reddit post. Actually, I hadn't until today. Um, and I just didn't notice it. And I was like, oh, cool. And there go back and forth and more discussion on this particular topic and talking about the issues with some of the things on there. So it's still an interesting discussion. I want people to be ever vigilant in their fight against malware. Uh, like I said before, it's all a team sport. We're all hopefully on the same team. Everyone watching this, maybe a few of you aren't, like I said, but for the most part, I believe most of you watching this are on the same team. You want better threat protection for yourself. You want better threat protection for your clients. Uh, no one really wants to see anyone getting hacked, but that's what this follow-up's about, is just keeping your eyes open. And once again, this is just one little piece of the security stack. There's so much more to it. You have layers of, you know, whether or not you have to run antivirus, other types of web or content filtering, especially for particularly lockdown environments, and um, so much more. User training being one of the big ones, spam filtering, because most things come in through spam. Um, I will probably expand to be doing a list of, you know, some of the other things that we do and talking about how you build out your threat stack and how you monitor for things and all that. That'll be a future video I do plan on doing. But it's also ever changing. I've talked about it before, but you'll find that it's keeping up with it. It's a challenge. It's something we do all the time. It's something we're always working to be better at. And that's also why I throw these videos out there because I love hearing back from you and I love all this participation in the forums so we can all work together to make you know security better. All right, thanks. And thank you for making it to the end of the video. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more content from the channel, hit the subscribe button and hit the bell icon if you like YouTube to notify you when new videos come out. If you'd like to hire us, head over to lawrencesystems.com, fill out our contact page, and let us know what we can help you with and what projects you'd like us to work together on. If you want to carry on the discussion, head over to forums.lawrencesystems.com where we can carry on the discussion about this video, other videos, or other tech topics in general, even suggestions for new videos. They're accepted right there on our forums, which are free. Also, if you'd like to help the channel out in other ways, head over to our affiliate page. We have a lot of great tech offers for you. And once again, thanks for watching and see you next time.